Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar this morning. Sorry we're running just a little bit late, um, but it looks like we've got a number of people who have joined us, so we'll get started. Um, so my name is Emma Wigan. I am the Acting Communications Manager here at the Ecologic Program, and I have the pleasure of facilitating uh, this morning's Lunch and Learn session. Um, now before we begin, I am just going to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we we are all dialing in from this morning and pay my respect to their uh, elders past, present and any elders um, that we may have on the call with us this morning. Um, now you will see on your screen there, so I am joined by Kate Rowan, uh, who you'll be hearing from today. So Kate is the sustainability lead at the Northwest Program Alliance, which is part of the Level Crossing Removal Program. And they're responsible for delivering uh, a range of level crossing removal projects across Melbourne's North and Northwest. So thank you for joining us this morning, Kate. Um, now, just a little bit of background on Kate. So she is a leader in the sustainable infrastructure sort of sector with nearly 10 years experience driving change on major projects uh, in roles across both government and private sector. Now, one of the highlights of Kate's career was leading a world first investment study during her time at Melbourne's Metro Tunnel Project. Um, and here she was awarded uh, Future Green Leader of the Year by the Green Building Council of Australia in 2021. So Kate has lots of experience and she's got lots to share with us this morning. Um, now, in terms of the topic that we'll be covering, so um, Kate will be talking a little bit about innovation today, which I know is a topic of uh, particular interest to people. And she'll be talking about what the Northwest Program Alliance has done to stimulate innovation in the supply chain uh, and how this has led to them embedding recycled products into their program of works. Now, before I hand over to Kate, we've just got some quick housekeeping rules, which I'll quickly touch on now. Um, so we will get everyone to uh, stay on mute during the session this morning, because we do have lots of people on the call. Um, and there will be time for a Q&A at the end. So we will have about sort of 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so, but you can, as Kate's presenting, put some of those questions that you've got in that Q&A. Uh, and once we get to the end of the session, we will run through those. Um, now I'll hand over to you, Kate, uh, to start your presentation. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Okay, should be up and running. Is that ready to go? Yep, that's beautiful. Yep, I can see that. Excellent. Fantastic. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Kate. I'm sustainability lead on, on NWPA, which is one of the five alliances delivering the Level Crossing Removal Program. Um, and yeah, it looks like we've got lots of people in the room today. I don't know if everyone's familiar with, with the Level Crossing Removal Program, so I'll just do a really brief intro to Level Crossings first before we dive into the sort of topic of the day, which is uh, Project Beacon. LXRP. Uh, so if you have lived in Melbourne in the last uh, 10 years or so, you, you probably have stopped at one of our projects, lived near one, or have had uh, to take a replacement bus because of our works. Um, it was established by the Victorian government um, in 2015 um, and is a rolling program of infrastructure works with the aim of eliminating 110 level crossings by 2030. And so that program is literally removing the interface of, of road and rail, um, in a lot of instances, raising the rail line above the road um, in order to improve safety, congestion and deliver new community precincts. Um, the image on the right shows you all of the locations where LXRP has or, or will work as, as part of this program. So we're, we're everywhere. So that's a, a very brief intro to LXRP. One thing I would say about them um, is that as a government body, they are really exceptional at keeping the industry fresh and innovative. Um, which is great because you've got to be able to do that in order to keep people and organisations in, engaged. Um, and something really exciting happened at LXRP at the end of 2021, where LXRP issued a bit of a challenge to all alliances to develop something new, uh, which is which is great. How often does that happen where you get told to do something different and, and we'll support you? Um, and that's really where Project Beacon begins. Let's dive in. Um, so uh, this was a challenge that was issued to us to develop an industry changing initiative and make it a beacon for the industry to follow. So that's, that's the name, Project Beacon. Um, and all the alliances were given a theme to work on. And Northwest, uh, my alliance was given the theme of sustainability to, to work on, on a bit of a, a problem and a solution. Um, there is gonna be a lot of detail thrown around in, in this preso. So I thought I'd sort of upfront give you an idea of the timing and the scale of this project, uh, because we're coming up on three years now um, since it first began. Uh, very early 2022 when the challenge was first issued to us um, and we began identifying sustainability problems to solve. And um, it's, it's getting 
uh, well past crunch time and really close to finishing, which is really exciting as uh, sort of quarter three, quarter four of this year. Um, and uh, we'll talk through um, some of those steps that are sort of presented on that little timeline there. We'll start with the idea development phase um, uh, in, in 2022. The sustainability team at Northwest had a kickoff workshop um, in January, um, and we were really expertly guided by the LXRP Hive, time, Hive team, sorry, who are um, innovation and, and change management specialists. Like this is their bread and butter. They, they help people identify problems and, and work with them to do, develop solutions for those problems. Um, and they work through a design thinking process um, as a first step for us. Um, and that's what that sort of, uh, so sort of grab at the top there, that's the design thinking um, process and, and how it's to be implemented. Um, and at this sort of very early stage, we didn't even really know what our problem was. We just had the theme of sustainability. Um, we got to divine, define that problem and, and sort of present it back to LXRP. So apart from our own team contributions and ideas about what we wanted to tackle, we had to get a source of ideas from other people around us as well, who would be able to help us understand sustainability problems and frame the problems better. We wanted to really go wide with our, with our work. Uh, so we conducted over 40 interviews with internal and external stakeholders to review those challenges and opportunities um, and from a whole range of functions as well. So we, we spoke to commercial people, innovation people, um, supply chain, all those sorts of things um, and a range of sources. And importantly, we spoke to people who support sustainability initiatives as, just as a concept, uh, but also people who we might consider typically as blockers to sustainability, uh, because they're really the ones who can provide honest feedback about why they think something won't work um, or will never work or would have to change in order for it to work. Um, so those were honestly some of the most valuable conversations at this idea development phase. And once we had enough information and data to start really unpacking the ideas we'd gathered, we moved into that solution development phase. So when framing the problem, um, two areas of focus um, emerged as really common themes for us. Um, and one of those was the recycled first policy. Uh, so this policy has been introduced by the Victorian government um, a few years ago to optimize the use of recycled and reused materials in construction of major pro transport projects. Um, so really that policy was something that people knew was there, um, but was seen as both an opportunity, but a real problem, like what are we gonna do about it? Um, and then the valley of death was also something that came up quite a lot. So people weren't necessarily speaking about this, this sort of um, uh, this um, graph of how ideas get developed and then and possibly go to die. Um, but really what was told to us is that particular concept that new suppliers are awarded startup or R&D funding to create a product um, or to create a solution, um, but sometimes fail to fully commercialize before the product or seed funding runs out. So you can do great work in identifying something, but the timelines around identifying, solving those issues and then implementing on construction um, was really, really difficult to overcome. So those were two sort of key themes that um, we, we sort of felt lay across all of the, the data that came to us. And we started to think about how we could develop a solution that would tackle both of these challenges and really deeply involve um, all of our stakeholders as well. So we went back to our original mandate um, and decided that in order to act as a beacon project, our solution would be to run a recycled first competition that partnered North Northwest with LXRP, with Ecologic, who are hosting us today, um, and our supply chain as well. Um, and the aim of that competition was to really develop an industry changing sustainability outcome through challenging emerging recycled materials suppliers to pitch us their product solutions or their product problems in order to optimize the use of those products. Um, we would want to be able to implement those products on the Keon Parade Level Crossing Removal Project. That was the next project that was coming up for us in terms of our program of work. So that seemed like the right place to do it. Um, and we would focus on the station and the surrounding urban precinct as well. We wanted to set up um, a, a judgment process where key stakeholders like, like the operators, the end users and, and um, the construction and design teams would judge those entrants um, and they would need to demonstrate their product capabilities um, to be able to achieve technical, safety, social, environmental, a range of different criteria. And the entrants would be vying for support in whatever that meant. That could be funding, it could be um, you know, in-kind support to further develop a product. Um, maybe they needed um, you know, to be to be contacted with the right people. It was really tell us your problems, um, give us your pitch, and and we'll, we'll we'll judge and we'll work with you if we can. 
And we wanted to be very deliberate about what the competition would actually do. So that meant not just solving recycled products on Key on Parade, that was going to be our application, but actually trying to mitigate the root cause of the problem. So really understanding and solving the heart of an issue with a product, why it wasn't being adopted easily. Um, we wanted to increase the pace of that materials adoption um, and importantly, provide a tangible example of sustainability in action. So um, we saw this as a great opportunity for storytelling. It's something we think we possibly aren't doing well in the recycled space. So we thought this will be our beacon project. We want to be able to tell stories and share those stories. Um, and also position LX up here as a, as a recycled first leader. So, um, you know, really, really taking that, that recycled first policy and, um, you know, positioning LXRP as the ones that can drive it. So once we thought this through and that sort of general approach was approved, we set up a program for how Project Beacon would run. Um, and it worked in a phase of competition, collaboration, and then deliver. Um, we got busy briefing the market on this competition. Um, and I think it's interesting, we didn't know at this stage whether we would be able to work with one or with many suppliers. Um, so we wanted to just get as many groups involved as we could. Um, and we formed a partnership with Ecologic Northwest MTM Rail Operator um, and the LXRP Urban Design Advisory Panel, who have um, a really big stake in, um, in, in look and feel of, of the urban realm. The competition opened for two weeks in mid-August and we received 15 really, really high quality submissions. It was really exciting to see the response from the market. And the main, you know, main thing we wanted to understand from the suppliers was what barriers are you experiencing that you're seeking support to overcome in order for us to utilize you more. What do you need for us to use you? That was the that was the mandate. And boy, did we get some barriers. It was fantastic. Um, they were really, really extremely variable um, in their responses between suppliers. So we found no silver bullet. There was lots and lots of um, barriers identified um, and it gave us a great shopping list of problems to fix. Um, and see, these are just some of the most common ones that we that we heard. Um, so local manufacturing and green premiums, we heard that buying green does initially cost more. Um, so there's minimal opportunity for projects to um, normalize and bring the price down over time or at scale. Um, the benefits of recycled products aren't yet considered well in cost decision making. Um, so there's difficulties in quantifying those benefits to support cost outcomes. So it's a bit of an issue that feeds itself um, you can't implement, so you can't understand the data and the cost, um, and so you don't fit it into the next project either. There's also less um, want to change how we work. You know, it's really hard to overcome the desire to design differently um, because we want to buy what we know. It's a pretty normal, normal human reaction. Um, and difficult to not question whether it's just another way of doing something. Um, you know, we can bring, bring people products, but um, there's the perception that it's not broke, so why would we change? Uh, you're pretty standard risk perceptions of recycled products over virgin products, you know, will it perform, is it safe, approvals, um, always a very challenging one to overcome. Um, and then finally, uh, suppliers told us that there was challenges with certainty of works pipelines. So they want to upscale, they want to build their business, um, but it's an uncertain market at the moment, it has been um, for a couple of years, especially in Victoria, and how are we, over gonna, how are we going to overcome that? So it was absolute gold in some of those responses. Um, we fed it into a bit of a multi-criteria analysis um, to decide which problems we wanted to try and resolve. Um, and the judges uh, took it very seriously and took a both a quantitative approach to this. So there was a lot of data that was supplied to us um, in the, the competition submissions, um, you know, things like where it could be installed on KP. Would that give us data? Would it give us expected costs? Would it give us actual costs? That kind of thing. Um, and then we also took a qualitative um, look at it as well. So what was the experience that we could draw on um, by using um, these products or by working with these suppliers? How would it create value elsewhere um, in the social and technical space? Would it contribute to a legacy for LXRP? Was it replicable? Was it scalable in future projects? Um, yeah, very detailed, very collaborative, and it helped us shortlist a range of suppliers um, and partners that we wanted to work with. So that was the idea solution, the competition phase and the decision-making phases done. Um, and that took us to quarter two um, of 2023. So we've been going for just over a year at this stage. Um, and we identified successful suppliers that um, we wanted to work with. And they were sort of split evenly into two groups. Um, one was strategic partnerships. So these were suppliers and products that required time and funding uh, to develop and implement a solution. Uh, and then there was also products that we considered optimised or needed to be optimised. So they were close to mainstream use. Um, they needed smaller scale support to embed 
Um, we might have used them little bits and pieces before, but they weren't necessarily BAU yet. Uh, so I'll run through some of those now. All right, RoboVoid. Um, it's a recycled plastic void former. These are one of the these are the strategic partnerships I'll run through first. This product's 100% recycled plastic. It's 100% recyclable as well. Uh, it's lightweight, it's durable, and it's cheap. Uh, and it removes about 30% of the concrete volume of an element. Uh, RoboVoid are based in Thomastown, so it's even better. Um, you know, they're local for Northwest. Uh, and we are going to apply it in a small park tier slab um, at KP, at Keon Parade. Uh, so a small application first, uh, but the long-term goal for that is that we're designing it into our next project, our Melton level crossing removal projects, into the structures space. So the intent now is to get it into a concrete stitch between some wall structures, so moving um, from a small structure into, into bigger ones. Um, and Keon's really that cool test case. So really the application often... Um, doesn't matter whether you're going big or small, you still need to go through all of the intense approvals, getting everyone comfortable with the fact that this is actually less material um, and it still achieves the same outcome. Um, so you've got to go through those processes. So hopefully on Keon, what we've done is we've worked through all of those challenges um, and now it's just standard design assurance processes um, for the next big project. So Keon's going to be the test case, a really cool promotional piece um, with the longer term view for, for Melton. Uh, I think we are starting to see this product um, crop up in walls and, and structures on, on road projects as well, which is super exciting. We also partnered with Series Fairwood, um, who helped us strategically store and reuse as much of the Site 1 timber as possible. Uh, so Fairwood's a not-for-profit social enterprise. They're located in Preston um, and they supply locally sourced, recycled, salvaged and reclaimed Australian hardwood. Uh, so we want to work with them because we're often challenged by reuse of timber on our sites. Uh, the challenge is that we don't really normally have a lot of control um, over the timing of storage and milling of, of furniture from our site one timber. And Fairwood supported us in storing it and returning um, and milling the wood um, into some furniture items like bench seats, outdoor stools and habitat logs. And then the long-term thinking piece there is that we uh, develop a bit of a guide for designing for that specific type of reuse. Uh, so you know, even earlier than the design phase, we can identify the timing and the cost of trees for reuse and use back on site. Um, so it's being strategic in that way that we haven't been able to before and utilising that relationship with series going forward. We're also working with future aggregates. Um, so they supply recycled plastic aggregates for concrete uh, from the Victorian waste stream. Uh, so Future Ag, I don't think it worked on, on infrastructure projects like ours before. So part of the intent um, of working with them was trialling, testing and bringing a new supplier of recycled plastic ag onto the program and bringing the cost down over time. Uh, so it means that we're building up the supply chain in that space. And they've supplied us with aggregates in an exposed ag application, which is the picture there on the right. It's in the ground now, which is really, really great. Um, and you really can't tell the difference between the product. It's got our operator approval um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're rolling it out onto other projects as well. And Curvecrete. So Curvecrete's an organisation based in West Footscray. Um, they produce robotically curved concrete elements using a mould and digital engineering um, in order to shape uh, freshly poured concrete. Um, that's really where my robotics knowledge starts and ends, um, but it's a very cool approach to casting concrete. They can do heaps of different shapes and different applications, um, way different to how we might normally form up um, curved concrete. Um, it's yeah, really, really funky. And I guess the, the other point of difference there is that they use geopolymer concrete. So that concrete has no cement. That's the really carbon intensive. That's the evil stuff that um, we try and reduce uh, on projects. So great sustainability outcome. And it's our entry into the geopolymer market, uh, which is a product that's a bit difficult to come by at the moment. Um, there's different groups working on really bringing it into the construction space, different concrete working groups, which is fantastic. And hopefully we'll be able to apply it on a larger scale, hopefully structures one day. Uh, but this is Northwest's demonstration case. Um, and it's being used in a modular concrete bench that we co-designed with them. Um, I actually think our, our landscape architects are, are there this morning, possibly possibly now. So we're still working through these things. Um, this is by no means finished. We're still getting the final ticks um, on this particular innovation. Um, but the intent is that we have modular shapes for our concrete benches. Hopefully they can um, design and provide those, those same modular pieces for level crossing removal or just you know projects in the urban realm. Um, in future as well. Um, and the final strategic application one is solving the issues with recycled plastic viaduct screens. So our current solution for um, 
our, our screens on top of our rail viaducts um, is aluminium. Uh, and we're working with Lee, Lee Group and our architects to develop a bit of a proof of concept to be able to, uh, to be applied on our, our Melton level crossing removal project. So we're just working through the challenges of um, recycled plastic in the rail space and how we replicate it for future projects and meeting all the design intent and the design approvals at the moment. Uh, of all the initiatives, this is the one that will have the most significant carbon reduction. Aluminium is really carbon intense. Um, so we're really motivated to, to get it done and yeah. And then finally, we've just got a little list of some of those optimized um, uh, products here, recycled glass in our surface colored, uh, colored surface treatment for roads and in the urban realm, recycled plastics and other bits and pieces in, in asphalt. Um, and the bottom one there is uh, Resonate, which is another recycled plastic aggregate product. Uh, so Resonate's actually quite interesting. Um, they entered the market um, more formally earlier this year. Um, and we were at the space where we were just test pouring our future aggregate mix. Um, so we were able to get them in to also do a test pour, get Resonate in to also do a small test pour, um, and really just take advantage of the fact that we were, you know, um, in that test and, and final approval stage. So I, I think it's great. I think it shows the power of setting up a framework and project headspace for, for innovation because we were able to get them approved in the ground within a matter of months, all under the notion and the idea that, well, why not? Like we're delivering a beacon project. Let's get another group on because they're ready. They can supply um, and we, we got them in the ground. So it's really fantastic. So this is a bit of an old render. Um, it looks different now, so, you know, screenshots, but um, it'll be beautiful. I think our hope um, really with Key on Parade when this is finished by, you know, uh, quarter three, quarter four of this year is that we'll be able to stand in the middle of Key on Parade in the precinct um, and be able to point to a range of elements that are all made out of recycled stuff. So we've got our test cases that show that infrastructure is a real solution for reuse and diversion of waste. Um, we can be we can be a real source uh, for the government. Um, infrastructure projects can be the final resting place for a lot of those waste products. Hopefully it gives confidence in the market that we can do this kind of work. Um, and yeah, really create a point of pride, I think for our projects and our communities that, that Key on Parade is gonna be this you know, truly recycled precinct. So we're not quite done yet though. We're, we're having final install of um, a lot of those products on Key on Parade. So it'll be finished pretty soon. Um, we have to implement our solutions on, on Melton to really tie off those some of those really key strategic pieces, the screens and, and, and RoboVoid in, in structures um, to show that it can keep rolling onto future projects. We've got to do a bit more work in that calculating and quantifying carbon benefits of recycled product and the benefits of waste diverted um, from the waste stream onto our projects because we want to have a really solid way of assessing um, assessing that and being able to inform future costs and decision making. Um, we've got the MCA that was set up and, and LXRP um, is starting to measure things in value for money from a carbon perspective. So we're sort of well on our way with that piece. Um, this Prezo didn't really touch on lessons learned and there are a lot of them. Uh, so I think that will come, come later um, about what we would repeat and what we would do differently in, in the funding and the, the project management in the adoption space. There's, there's lots of lessons we'll be able to share, um, share when this is done. And also promote and communicate uh, lots of pictures that will be coming. You'll be flooded with them all, I think. And then finally, I just want to do a shout out to the people who really got this off the ground. It has been a few years in the making. Um, I've, I've been around uh, since uh, late 2021. Um, I get the benefit and the, the privilege of being able to talk about it today. But really, uh, without Fiona and LXRP and Ecologic, um, this vision really wouldn't have got off the ground at the time. Um, the Keon Parade team were really incredible. You know, this is sort of being managed by a few different groups um, and the challenges didn't stop once we, we got the funding and we knew what we were doing that just kept coming and the key on parade just kept going and they were really supportive and steered the ship which I think we're incredibly grateful for um, and then finally everyone who nominated for the competition we wouldn't have been able to do what we did without understanding the challenges and, and working with you to solve them um, they saw the value of what Northwest was trying to do so you know this is my spruik moment please reach out to everyone um, that was presented um, in this, um, they're ready and they're excited to work with you. So uh, really go for it. I think that's all. Thank you. Lovely. 
Thanks for that, Kate. And I know I feel super inspired after seeing that. And I know a lot of us here at Ecologic who have sort of been part of the journey. I can't wait to see some of these products sort of make it into the ground, which I know is going to happen over the next uh, couple of months, which is super exciting for us to see. And I think it also kind of shows the, you know, if we kind of work together as a sector, that we can really kind of drive change. And I know this project's going to leave a lasting, lasting legacy for some of the infrastructure projects that are coming through, uh, particularly as we are seeing some of these products used for the first time on the level crossing removal project at Cam Parade, but a lot of these applications can be used on smaller projects or other sort of infrastructure as well. So no, it's really exciting. But um, I haven't got any questions in the Q&A yet. So I might just remind everyone that if you do have any questions for Kate, we do sort of have about 15 minutes left uh, just to test her on some of this stuff and ask some questions. But I might get you to stop sharing your screen, Kate, sure. for now. And then um, we'll wait for a few questions, but I do have a few ones that I did sort of want to ask. Um, I know you sort of did touch a little bit on that sort of legacy piece and, you know, the things you've done sort of as part of the Keon Parade you're looking to sort of do on Melton, but what sort of other, what sort of broader legacy do you think Project Bacon is really leaving the sector? Um, I think the the process behind it is is replicable. It could be scaled up, it could be scaled down, um, but it provides a bit of a framework for identify, test and implement all within the scope of one project and level crossings tend to be delivered in a really punchy kind of way. Um, and, you know, the valley of death doesn't always have to uh, mean that products die um, as soon as we start constructing. I think we've got a really good example of how products that are ready, you just need the know-how and the will to get them up and sorted. It, it can be done um, if you've got the support from from all angles, from your project team, project manager, and um, you know you don't always have to accept no, it's too late as as an answer. I also think the other thing there is that um, a lot of the the for example, I think the future aggregates and the resonate pieces, um, the the volume of the recycled plastic in the mix, um, it's low. Uh, because it's a test case, you know, we replaced, I think in the end, only a few percent of the, of the virgin product in those mixes. Um, I now have a blueprint to go, okay, so on the next one, I'm going to set you up with a test pour to exceed that, you know, let's double it, let's triple it, let's test it, we'll get it in the ground, we know that it works, we know who to ask and we know um, what needs to happen in order for it to be rolled out. Um, it doesn't have to be finalised, you know, come, come project award, we can, we can change and we can sustain on the fly. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. Like as we've seen with the Mordialic Freeway, when they first sort of trialled the um, recycled plastic noise walls, I think we started with sort of 30, 40% recycled plastic in them. Now we're sort of up to that sort of 75%, 80 that's now been approved for use. So, you know, you make that sort of small investment and I think it kind of, as things get used a little bit more and tested, yeah, it can really drive that change. Um, but we do have a few questions that have come through the Q&A. Um, so Saji has said, what's the emission reduction impact of Project Beacon? Good question, Saji. Uh, we do, we need to quantify it. So I think we've got a really good um, initiative by initiative assessment. That was part of what we had to justify would be the benefit. Um, Saji's messaging me saying she should have asked anonymously because she is on my project. You can ask me on Monday, Saji. Um, that, that'll be a, a next step for us because I would like to look at it not only on um, a, you know, material by material assessment. Um, I'd like to look at it as a whole and understand the value of nominating a few things from a <laughs> a few things from a, a cost per ton of carbon perspective, that kind of thing. Um, so I guess an example of that is the the Curvecrete um, products. I knew that that would be you know upwards of ninety percent carbon reduction for that initiative. But I want to know what that means for all of the bench seats or all of the particular concrete application on the next project. And how do we input to that? So that was a long way of saying that um, we have small information on those data pieces. Um, we need to finalise it mm. and share. Yeah, and it might even be worthwhile getting you back sort of once everything's done and dusted, Kate, just to kind of give us part two of this story and sort of share some of those, yeah, absolutely, some of those stats and facts and some of those lessons learned. Um, now, John's got a question. Will there be another Project Beacon? Um, I, I good, great question. I'd I'd love to see, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. It's it was a huge amount of wonderful work. Um, I think it's replicable in all sorts of forms. So I, I was speaking to um, a colleague who I think is online today about how they could do something similar in the social space. Um, how can we stimulate the supply chain in different ways? So 
I think it's definitely not the last time we've seen something like this from projects. That's great. Um, and then we've got one from Patrice. So she said, hi, Kate, I remember hearing about recycled glass being used in the reflective road surfaces at Keon Park. Is this the same resource as the recycled glass for the coloured surfaces? Are there any differences? Uh, without knowing the source, I probably can't say, but I, I, I can probably say that it's not, um, it's, it's not a particularly controversial uh, product or anything. So it probably is, is quite similar. There's a couple of suppliers on, on the market. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, shoot you an email or something. Um, our supplier, I think, was Omnigroup, but there's a couple floating around um, that, can, that can provide it. Yeah, and we can share some information. Yeah, more information mm -hmm. on that after this. Yeah. Um, now we've got a question um, just around sort of like, obviously there were many project oh, products that were used sort of as part of Project Beacon that sort of came through that first sort of challenge that we set as well. Um, so this person just asked sort of, what are the steps being taken to avoid the valley of death and are there sort of wider <laughs> approvals with DTP and asset owners and stuff that needs to be considered? Yeah. What are the steps we're taking to avoid the valley of death? Um, Great question. I, I'd i probably like to step it out a little bit more. It's probably not something I can speak to with much confidence now. I think first step is to understand it and understand exactly the timing around those sorts of things. Um, we had a very, we had to have a very clear idea with who we brought on about the drop dead dates of when this would become impossible with those sorts of things. And we kept it was got pretty tight with some of the the groups that we were working on um but then i think we were able to delineate that by saying okay well this isn't going to work for keon that's why we'll solve the design issues for this for keon but we'll implement on melton um so if you can apply it as a lens to your own timelines that's a good first step but i'm sure there's a range of science and academic research that's gone into that <laughs> And I would say too, Kate, was there kind of at a point where you were like a go, no go with this? Like say, for instance, a barrier, as they've kind of said here, could be that type of approval and, you know, it might not just not get up, but was it important sort of to have the right people in the room to make sure that you knew this was going to be feasible from the outset? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also think we still haven't got over the risk that well, all of these, especially at the time of award, are innovations and we think they're going to work. Everyone's saying, yes, this is a good idea and these are good approaches, good suppliers um, and useful products to work with. They ticked a whole lot of boxes. But what happens if something happens and we can't actually deliver it? You know, um, there was a lot of those go, no goes moments throughout there. It, it, that, that sort of, that question never really went away. Yeah, and I think kudos to you guys for kind of pushing through because <laughs> some of those barriers, but I think we were all able to sort of effectively work together to kind of uh, and kind of keep that main sort of goal out there that we were all working towards, which I think was super important as we went through this. Um, now, Stephen said um, with this sort of range of projects, particularly the products that we uh, sort of came through this process, particularly for those ones that are quite new, is there a plan uh, to have them sort of approved for use in sort of road and rail applications? Definitely in rail. Um, and we can share those. I, I think um, that uh, the ag ones, we've got the sort of the design approval documents that I'm sure at some point we'll be able to share. Uh, road might be another story, but that would be a really great next step to understand if there's barriers to those products in outside of the rail space. That's good. Because I should say that we did um, end up only applying products in the MTM area. I don't think we ended up using anything in the council space, not because we didn't want to, but I think that's just where it the it landed. That's great. Um, and then with the recycled plastic aggregate aggregate product, um, is this? We just got a question here. Was this used for structural purposes or non-structural purposes? Only in the precinct paving. So I think I think what did I, what was the wording I had? Probably just hardscape, um, which is very generic. But um, in the precinct paving um, mix, so you might see it in the shared user paths. Um, in, the, in the walkways and the other paved areas up to the station. So nothing structural from perspective. Oh, thanks, Kate. And can it, can it be used in a structural context? I think that's the way that we're going. Um, I might be dobbing in one of my colleagues at Western, but I think they've used a recycled ag in a structural product. I'm, I might get Bo to confirm that at some point from Western Program Alliance and, and share it because I'm pretty sure he got a really big structural concrete element with polyrock index. Yeah.
Oh, nice. No, that's great. Um, and then we've got a question here from Kerry. So she said, was there any consideration sort of as you were going through the evaluation process about the reuse of products at the end of life? Um, and sort of when you're looking to decommission, like was that something you took into consideration when, when yeah, evaluating those products you chose? That's a really good question because that wasn't something we necessarily assessed or awarded on. It was one of the key problems named in that uh, a lot of our suppliers are getting asked about reuse. Can we can we crush it down and recycle it the same way we would normally with concrete or, or other products? Um, and they don't have the answer to that question. Um, so that is a key problem that I don't know if we fully solved via this process. I know that some can be recycled via the normal pathway, but um, do I have a sheet of paper that says that at this stage? Probably not. Mm. And I know that some of the products sort of have started considering that. Like I know when we were at it, sort of RoboVoid recently, they have um, uh, recently had a trial where they've kind of looked at that end use. And I know that mm. it is able to be recycled at the end, which is which is awesome. But yeah, it's definitely something that I know we're considering. Yeah, is a key consideration for some of these infrastructure projects. Um, now we've got one from Frank. Um, so he said here that, you know, noting the green premium is one of the barriers to adopting uh, products with recycled content. Um, was this, yeah, obviously this was a bit of a barrier, but how did you guys sort of overcome that through this process? Yeah, I think um, giving a good test case and showing uh, that it can be done, setting up those suppliers with other suppliers, like your large concrete providers, um, teeing up those strategic partnerships will help bring that down over time. I think um, part of it's also naturally resolved because the it's been a tough year for, for recycled plastics with the collapse of, of Red Cycle and whatnot. Um, but now that particular program is up and running and there is an absolute stream of, of plastic waste and other types of waste that now can be used, um, particularly Resonate can accept lots and lots of different types of waste products. So their supply is enormous, you know, so there's no issues on the back end and um, there's more strategic partners set up on the front end and there's now examples of it being in the ground. Um, so that does create cost competition um, with virgin products and um, I'm not going to be able to quote data sources uh, to you, but virgin products are going to get more expensive. So this is the first step in, in, in normalising and, and equalising recycled with, with virgin products. Yeah. And for this particular sort of project example, did you kind of do a bit of that cost comparison as well? Like, did you kind of look to see if there was, it was much and what did that look yep. like? Um, uh, as a bit of a high level, I think we estimated around 30% extra over back in 2020 and 2021 start 2022 was the number that we were being told for a green version of a product. Yeah, that's great. So that's significant. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I know, as you said, sort of as these things become a little bit more BAU, it's likely that we will see that sort of, yeah, see those costs become a little bit more comparable. And it's definitely something we've seen with some of the products that have been on the market a little bit longer, like your recycled plastic noise walls and that type of stuff. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. So it will be interesting to see what sort of happens over the coming years. Yeah. Um, but I know people are probably really interested to kind of um, continue following you guys on your journey. So there is, you sort of said there's a bit of a plan to kind of share um yeah, some sort of lessons and some sort of more information kind of once this gets delivered? Yeah, I think we'd be looking at that towards the back end of, of this year once we've got a whole lot of, I'm, I'm hoping we have a suite of information to share um, that's not just beautiful images and examples, but, um, you know, documentation that supports uh, all of our suppliers, not just the ones that we, we, we partnered with. Um, so, yeah, watch this space for end of 24. No, we're looking forward to it. And I'll probably just dubbed you in for some more work to prepare yeah. some of this stuff. So happy, to. <laughs> happy writing. Um, yeah. No, that's all the questions that were in the Q&A. So I want to, uh, Kate, big thank you to you for sort of coming along uh, this afternoon. I know you're hoping everyone's feeling very inspired sort of what, uh, by what Project Pekin achieved. Um, I know we're very excited to see it sort of delivered over the couple of months. And um, if you follow us sort of on our ecologic channels, um, we'll be keeping a close eye on this one and sharing some of the outcomes of that. Yeah. Uh, once it gets delivered. Um, now, today's session was recorded as well, so if there's any sort of colleagues or people you think might be interested in hearing more about this, um, we will be sending a link to our YouTube channel um, after today. Um, and this was our final session for this round of Lunch and Learns that we're doing, and I think we're looking to sort of come back with some more 
um, amazing projects and examples to share uh, in August. Um, but we will have a survey going around because uh, if there are any sort of topics or anything you do want to hear more about, please fill out that survey and we'll definitely consider that in our next round of Lunch and Learn sessions um, later this year. Um, and then on the theme of innovation, um, we do at Ecologic, we run innovation showcases every couple of months where we do get sort of new suppliers and innovators um, who have great products or ideas um, that could be used in infrastructure to pitch their um, products and ideas to a panel of um, industry experts. So that's being held next Friday, the 24th of May. So if you are interested to see some of the latest and greatest products coming sort of through the market that you might be able to test and trial on your products or projects, uh, please come along to that. So we will share some more information about how you can register for that um, after this session. But um, thanks again, everyone who online for joining us today and some of the great questions you have. Um, but I hope you'll have a fabulous Friday and a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next time. Thank you.